Good morning. Can y'all hear me okay? All right. We're going to start off this morning at the... It's a little bit high. I'm sorry. We're going to start off this morning at the end of last week's lesson. I left off one passage of scripture because it got a little bit long, and then we'll move into lesson two, looking at Samuel. Um, and then just as a reminder, we're in the quarter, or actually two quarters. We're going to do two quarters on Elijah, not Elijah, Isaiah. Uh, we're going to spend two quarters looking at Isaiah. And so they had two lessons where we lead up to Isaiah. Um, in my personal opinion, the lessons were backwards, just from a chronological perspective, but I'm following the book's order, so that's what we're doing. Um, so last week we talked about the time of Samuel, the kings and all that leading up to it, or not Samuel, good grief, the times of Isaiah, leading up to the time of Isaiah, um, and then this week we're going to back up a little bit and look at uh, prophet, prophets or prophecies, starting with Samuel, with the creation of the kingdom of Israel. Uh, but we'll start off again this morning at the end of Deuteronomy, or end of Deuteronomy chapter 30. We'll look at verses 17 and 18. But if your hearts turn away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to you, swore to give your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so God's warning Israel here uh, in, through Moses that they can choose life or they can choose death. They can choose blessings or they can choose curses. All of that is based on whether they decide to follow God and stay faithful to him. And so that's all the way back starting with the time of Moses, and so then Moses dies the Israelites do enter the promised land, just as God had promised Abraham. And timing of that is somewhere around 1250 B.C., that they enter the land of Canaan. Um, just as a side note, land of Canaan named after who? Grand, grandson of Noah, Canaan himself, is the, the one that is named after, son of Ham. Um, and the reason I throw that in there, I just find it interesting, from a biblical perspective, all the cities that we have today that have a place in the Bible and have their origin in the Bible. Uh, I just like to point that out as we run across those. So at this point, um, after they enter the promised land, they enter a period of about 200 years where they're governed, um, governed's probably not the right word, but by judges and not by kings. And so there are 200 years where there is no kingdom of Israel, it's a nation of Israel, and they have judges really that uh, determine what's right and what's wrong. So at the end of the period of Judges is what leads us into the time of Isaiah. Um, and during that time, the prophets had a lot to do with the politics of the nation of Israel. And I think that's very fitting, of course, for Israel because Israel is the land of God's people. And so, of course, prophets sent from God, it would make sense that prophets have a lot to do with the politics uh, that go into that. I think similarly in our country, um, all politics aside, we were started by a group of Christian people. We were started as a Christian nation, um, and it, of course it hasn't taken that long, similar to us, uh, to kind of stray away from God. And we'll talk more about that at the end. And so entering into this period of Judges, um, actually at the end of the period of Judges, they go through the 200 years, there's an unnamed prophet in the, in the Bible that plays a role in transitioning from the next to last judge, which was Eli, um, Eli was the high priest and the judge at the time. The transition from him to Samuel, and Samuel would become the last judge, the last uh, priest, if you will, of, of Israel before the kingdom of Israel was established. Um, and the reason that Samuel, I keep wanting to say Samuel, everybody's Samuel this morning. <laughs> the reason that, uh, no, that is Samuel, that's right. The reason that Samuel comes in um, instead of Eli's son is why? Why do Eli's sons not uh, succeed him as a priest, as a judge? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. So they had no regard for the Lord. They treated God's offering with contempt. Um, and then also it says they had sexual affairs with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And so God did not consider them worthy. And he 
appointed, called Samuel, um, to be the next and the last judge. So we'll read next from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your family line and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel in your family line, there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I do not cut off from my altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears and grieve your heart and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. And what happens to your two sons will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house and he will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow before him for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead. Appoint me to some priestly office so that I can have food to eat. And so we see here where God is uh, sent, sends a prophet, and that's really what the whole lesson today is about, is about transitioning from judges to prophets and then into uh, kings, where the prophets continue to prophesy both to Israel to repent and turn back to God and to prophesy about the coming of Jesus. So Samuel um, was born into the house of Levi. He served under Eli, um, the priest, the high priest, and Eli, his period of judge uh, or priest was about 40 years. And so when Samuel was a young boy, the Lord called him. We read in one of the following chapters how the Lord called him. Um, he let Samuel know what would be coming, that he was uh, going to be appointing him. And then the Bible says that the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. Um, and then we, we read on, um, we'll read through in chapter 4, just as the prophet, the unnamed prophet had said uh, to Eli, his time as high priest and judge was cut short and his family was uh, killed in the prime of life. So Samuel was a priest, a prophet, and a judge? He was a priest, a prophet, and a judge. He was born into the house of Levi and he was a prophet and a judge, yes. He was not a king. And I think that's actually... One of the main reasons probably that he didn't become king because he was the other two. I would assume that's why God didn't appoint him. So in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of, the, of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. And so if you notice there, they asked the question, Why did God do this to us? But did they give God a chance to respond? Nope, they just took it upon themselves to go get the Ark of the Covenant. And they thought that that was God. If they bring that with them, well, obviously they're going to be protected. You know, there's, there's not any conversation with God. There's not any intercession with God. They don't ask the, the high priest, the judge. Uh, it's just the elders saying, well, let's go get some protection. And they think the Ark is the protection. Um, 
And so we see in this battle, if we read on, that Eli's two sons do end up getting killed in battle. And the Ark of the Covenant, I would say because it was not a thing of God to take it out to battle, it was captured. And so the Philistines got control of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, And then a messenger delivered the news to Eli of what had happened. Um, And when Eli was told what had happened, not about his two sons, but about the Ark, what happened to Eli? fell backwards, hit his head, and died. It said he was a large man, um, so I'm assuming he was probably on some big chair at the time. So he fell backwards, um, broke his neck, and died is what it said. And so the prophecy, this unnamed prophet, the prophecy came true. um, And it's at that point that they then transition into Samuel becoming the last judge, the last priest. Um, We do read throughout the next few chapters of Samuel where the ark ends up making its way back to the Israelites, and it's an interesting story. Um, it, it, it stays with the Philistines for about seven months, but why does it end up back with the Israelites? Do you remember the reason for that? Do what? Well, they couldn't, but it was God's Ark of the Covenant. So, that's the first thing. So, the first night they brought the Ark in to the Temple of Dagon. I guess is how you say it. Um, they came in the next morning and Dagon had fallen over and essentially like he was bowed down to the Ark of the Covenant of God. And so that they came in, fixed it, set Dagon back up, and they came in the following morning and Dagon had fallen over again. This time his head and his arms had broken off and were scattered across the threshold. Um, and at the time that the, the book was written, it says to that day, um, the Philistines still would not cross the threshold because of that, because of Dagon's head being there when it was destroyed. Um, but then after that, it wasn't just the Ark of God, God's Covenant uh, destroying Dagon, if you will. After that, he sent, uh, not plague, but sent disaster on the Philistines. And so the city where the Ark was, he uh, sent tumors to the people. He basically uh, afflicted them with tumors. And so after a little while, they decided they, that was probably the reason. They shipped it off to another city Uh, to Ekron, and once the ark got to Ekron, can you guess what happened to those people? Started getting tumors, just like the people before. So after a period of seven months, uh, the Philistines pick up the phone and call the Israelites and say, you got to take this thing back. We don't want it anymore. Um, And so uh, that's what happens. It does get returned to the the Israelites. And then that brings us up to 1 Samuel chapter 7. And I'm going to start in verse 3, and I'm reading this passage mainly because it's in the book. I'm trying to follow along with the book. Um, so 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 3. And this is after Samuel uh, has come into a leadership role. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all of your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Philistines put away their bells and asterisks and served the Lord only. And we talked about that last week. One of the big uh, faults of the Israelites was not that they completely turned away from God, but they also substituted other gods. And so that's what this verse is telling us, that they, not that they turned away from bells and asterisks and turned back to God. It says they did away with the bells and the asterisks, however you say that, um, and they worshiped God only. So they went back to God being their one God. Continuing on in verse 5, And then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On, the day, on that day they fasted, and there they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. And they said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, 
the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But, but that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point at Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen, and he named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israelite territory again. Now, I think at this point there had been about 20 years between the Ark of the Covenant being under Philistine control and then getting back to uh, the Israelites. And so the people that were there, it wasn't fresh on their minds of what had happened. Uh, but if you read the scripture and what happened, and when they go in to start attacking the Israelites and it starts thundering, this big thunder, uh, it's almost as if their memories are, are jogged and they remember what the God of Israel did to them when they had his Ark under their control. And so they get scared, they turn away, they run, and they're pursued by the Israelites and defeated in battle. Um, the, the book points out in that verse 12, I like the point the book made, made, it talks about Samuel saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. So he's not making the same mistake that some of the leaders of Israel before him and after him make, where they think, well, God is always with us, we are God's people, he's always going to be with us. And so he says, thus far meaning he's been with us in this battle. We're making this, uh, what it call it? It's not a statue, is it? It's a stone. Yeah, I'm setting this stone up here because you don't make an idol, but a, so a stone is a reminder that God was with us. And it's a reminder that he, he will be with us if we're faithful to him because all this happened right after Israel turned back to God and to God only. So Samuel continues on to serve as the last judge of Israel. Um, before his death, he helps in establishing the kingdom of Israel. So he's the one that anoints Saul as the first king, and then later we see that he anoints David as well as Saul's successor. Um, but anoint, anointing a king was not Samuel's original plan. What was Samuel's original plan? What did he think should happen? He was happy with the model of the judges and the priests. And his plan was that his sons would take over once he moved on or passed away. Um, that was what Samuel thought would happen. But we read in, in the book of 1 Samuel that the people ask for a leader. They ask for a king of Israel. And the reason for that is the same as the reason for Eli. They say that Samuel's sons aren't the most godly, and that's not who should be judging Israel. And so Samuel prays about it, talks to God. God ends up saying that, yes, that's what you should do. If that's what they want, they want a king, give them a king. They wanted, a they wanted a military That's right. They wanted somebody that was a military leader, that was powerful, um, that any time they were attacked, they, they wanted somebody that was notorious, um, that has defeated people in battle. I guess the reason for that is, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would say that the, the judges probably weren't, the ones that were well known throughout the rest of the nations that were surrounding them. Um, they might have led them in battle, but they weren't considered a military leader, like Butch has mentioned. We'll look next at 1 Samuel chapter 12. Start in verse 1. Samuel said to all of Israel, I have listened to everything you said to me, and I have set a king over you. Now you have a king as your leader. As for me, I am old and gray, and my sons are here with you. I have, I have been your leader for, from my youth until this day. Here I stand. Testify against me in the presence of the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose, don whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I accepted a bribe to make me shut my eyes? If I have done any of these, I will make it right. You have not cheated or oppressed, uh, or oppressed us, they replied. You have not taken anything from anyone's hand. Samuel listened to them. The Lord is witness against you, and also his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found anything in my hand. He is witness, they said. 
Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your forefathers up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here, because I am going to confront you with evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your fathers. And so in my Bible, this passage is titled Samuel's Farewell Speech. Um, typically in the Old Testament, that's attributed to somebody's dying words, but that's not what this is. This is Samuel uh, addressing the Israelites as his last point in time as their leader or their only leader. Because before that, the judges were considered the leaders of Israel. And so now he's handing off power um, at this time to Saul. And he's just kind of clearing the air, making sure that they recognize that he has not cheated anybody. Um, I think this is really for his sake to make sure that he hadn't done anybody wrong. And if he had, he wants to clear the air. Um, we did talk about last quarter, and when we looked at David, we talked about the transition of power from David to Saul. Um, at God's direction, Samuel anoints David as a boy when he first comes to play the harp for Saul. Um, he anoints David. Samuel anoints David. And then it's at that same time that this, when David is anointed that the Spirit of God actually leaves Saul. And Saul has an evil spirit that comes in and torments him from that point forward. So then at the end of David's reign as king, Samuel has already passed away. Um, so another prophet takes over. We're talking about prophets, and that's the whole point of this lesson. Prophets take over. The prophet has a key role in determining the next king of Israel. Um, so when David is old and weak, he has several sons by that point. Which son um, tries to take over? Because it doesn't happen from God first. There's a son that tries to take over. Do you remember? Hey, yep, the A word, Adonai. Adonijah, I can't say that, Adonijah. Um, so Adonijah, one of uh, Saul's sons, nope, one of David's sons, decides that he's going to become king, except he doesn't run it by David. He goes and talks to some of the priests, um, confers with them, gains their support, and then he sets out to make this big sacrifice and this big ceremony, and he invites the priests, he invites all of his brothers, except for who? Solomon. He doesn't invite Solomon, um, and he doesn't invite Nathan. So Nathan is the prophet um, that helps with this transition to the next king. He doesn't invite Solomon, Nathan, or Benai is the third one. And so after, after Nathan sees what's going on, he sees that um, Adonijah, I've got to read it to say it right. After he sees Adonijah trying to take power, um, Nathan goes to Bathsheba, which is Solomon's mom, um, and then he goes to David and confers with the two of them, and he ends up asking David, is this what you want as your successor? And so David says, no, that's not, not what's supposed to happen. And David ends up declaring that Solomon will be the next king. Um, and so Solomon is then taken out during this ceremony while uh, Adonijah is trying to become king. Solomon's taken out and paraded in front of those crowds. And so the Bible tells us that the crowds disperse, they leave. Um, but then what would normally happen when you've got a king and you've got two people going for the throne when the king's at the end of life? How does that usually end? Battle. Somebody's going to die, right? Somebody's got to die because otherwise whoever gets to be king's always looking you know, behind them for that other person. And so... And neither of these, I don't think, were the firstborn of David. Um, this, this is a little bit different than some because it was two of the king's sons that were fighting over the throne. Um, and maybe because they weren't going in order, oldest to youngest, is uh, maybe that's why they didn't battle. I don't know. But anyway, Solomon, uh, well, Adonijah ends up being afraid. Once they, he sees Solomon coming out, he knows that Solomon is 
um, has the blessing of David, his father. And so Adonijah is scared. He's afraid. And so what does he go do? Do you remember? We'll read it in 1 Kings chapter 1. Verses 45 through 53. Is that right? First Kings 1. Let me make sure that's right. Yeah. So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him, meaning Solomon, king of Gihon. Nope, that's not right. Not Solomon. Let me start back at verse 43. Not at all, Jonathan answered. Our Lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benai the son of Jehoda, the Kirthites and the Pelathites, and they have put him on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king of Gihon. From there they have gone up cheering, and the city resounds with it. That's the noise you hear. Moreover, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Also, the royals have, royal officials have come to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours, and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed in, in worship on his bed and said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who, who has all, allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. At this, all Adonijah's guests rose in alarm and dispersed, but Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Then Solomon was told, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon and is clinging to the horns of the altar. He says, let Solomon, King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon replied, if he shows himself to be a worthy man, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Then King Solomon sent men and they brought him down from the altar, and Adonijah came and bowed down to King Solomon, and Solomon said, Go to your home. So Adonijah was quick to try to assume the throne, but then when he realized that it wasn't his to assume, he was very quick to bow down to his brother uh, and recognize that he can't compete against God's will and his father's will. So a prophet, Samuel, was as responsible for establishing the kingdom of Israel um, and anointing the first and second king. And then a prophet, Nathan, was responsible for carrying out God's plan to ensure that Solomon, not Adonijah, became the third king of Israel. And then after that, the prophet Ahijah had a hand in Jeroboam becoming the first king of Israel when Jordan split off. That's what we were talking about last week, where Jeroboam rose up against Solomon uh, and split off ten tribes of Judah. And so I wanted to read that prophecy of Ahijah from, the, from 1 Kings chapter 11. So this explains a lot of what we talked about last week. Um, it's a prophecy before it happens. 1 Kings 11 verses 29 through 40. About that time Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem. And Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. But for the sake of my servant David in the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidians, Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Melech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in my ways, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my statutes and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hands. I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who observed my commands and statutes. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands <coughs> and I will give you ten tribes.
I will give I will give one tribe to his son, so that David, my servant, may be <coughs> excuse me, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all that your heart desires. <coughs> excuse me. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and commands, as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam, Jeroboam fled to Egypt uh, to Shishak the king and stayed there until Solomon's death. So that's where we're going to end the lesson today is um, with Solomon. The kingdom of uh, Israel splitting up into two kingdoms, uh, Israel and Judah. And we talked last week about the, the ten tribes and the two tribes. Um, I find it interesting in the prophecy, the prophecy talks about the ten tribes breaking off, but then it says that they'll get, he will give Jeroboam, no, he will give Solomon one tribe. So that leaves one tribe that's not there. So which tribe is that, that they're, that's not in that, included in that? So we know the tribe of Judah is what becomes the nation of Judah. And then 10 of the tribes break off. So the other tribe is the tribe of Benjamin that eventually comes back to Judah. And then we see later after that, there's some Levites, uh, tribes, the tribe of Levi, that see the ways of those in Israel and they come back to Judah as well. Um, so kind of the application to our lives. As we look at this lesson, we see as we see throughout the history of the Israelites, uh, the Israelites coming back to God and then going back a few hundred years later and turning back to idols and other gods, uh, turning away from God and then coming back. It's a cycle. Um, that's kind of, as we look at our nation today, I often think about the history of the kingdom of Israel and how things went in cycles. And I think that's what we're doing in our country. Um, as we talked about at the beginning, we were established as a Christian nation. Um, on the principle of free freedom of religion, so we weren't, uh, even though we were established as a Christian nation, we weren't exclusive of anybody that wanted to come worship some other way. Um, but we weren't established by a group of Mormons or Buddhists. We were established by a group of Christians who wanted a, the freedom to serve God the way that they thought that the Bible said that we should serve God. Um, so to me, I just find passages like this in the Old Testament encouraging um, that no matter what happens, no matter what takes place, we know God is in control and we know God can choose somebody um, to help us get through that time, to lead us through that time. So whichever end of the political spectrum you're on, um, we can recognize as Christians that whoever's put in place, whether we think they should have been there or not, God's going to use them to get us to the next point. Um, and even though I, you know, I personally feel like we're in kind of in a downward spiral as a, as a country, as a world, um, I kind of feel like we're on the side that the Israelites, when they're starting to turn away from God, I know that God is in control. And I know that eventually we will turn back to him. Um, so that's the end of my lesson today. Is there any discussion on today's lesson? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful for this congregation. Lord, we thank you for the group of people that assemble here to look at your word and study it so that we can apply it to our lives, so that we can learn from it, and so that we can be better Christians and walk in the light each day. God, we ask that as we go into this hour of worship, we pray that you will help us to clear our hearts and our minds and to not think of the things of this world. Help us to come before you and give our hearts and our minds solely to you as we sing praises to you and we listen to the sermon that's been prepared. Lord, for those that are out sick, we know we have so many sick right now. We ask that you give them healing. For all those that are in the hospital, we pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that are attending to them, Lord. 
We ask that you will bring everyone back to us as soon as possible. In Christ's name, amen.